Try growing up in East Hull, playing 500 Super League games and having 19 operations, smashing every bone in your body. And then you want to question me about my toughness because I wore gloves, <laughs> sit down, or I'll shut you up. <laughs> Welcome back to Out of Your League. The gloves are off today, Mark, aren't they? Yeah. And we're joined by the Leeds Rhinos head coach, Lois Vassell, Welcome old friend always. of mine. Yep. Thank you for New having England me. assistant coach as well. Yep. Did you know that, Mark? I did indeed, yeah. Yeah, and you might, if you're watching on YouTube or wherever you watch the podcast, even if you're listening, you think, John hasn't said anything yet. Mm. That's because John has left the podcast officially. Yeah. Yep. Um, he has gone. Again. I don't know how we feel. We've just, we're processing the news. It wasn't a surprise, really, was it? I think um, he was um, poked a little bit these last few weeks by mm. you, and then he's flipped out. Bear. Yeah, he's flipped out. He's thrown his toys out of the pram. Yeah. He's got all upset, and he's um, pulled a sickie. But we he we're hearing from his legal team that it, that's it, it's done. He's done. He has left the podcast. So if you were tuning in over the last six years, Mark, I think yeah. six years, if you were tuning in for the last six years um, for John and his rants, we hope you stay with us. Um, mm. I think John has moved on to another podcast. We might get some people tuning in, actually, coming back to the podcast. And we are therefore auditioning for a new co-host. Yeah. Uh, slash pundit. Have you got anyone in mind, Mark? Uh, Kyle Aymore. Yeah. He's good, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> Kyle's good. Kyle will be good. Kyle is very much welcome. By the way, that, that um, rant from, from John about the gloves, I'm told, had 300,000 views across social media, yeah. which is quite disturbing, really, isn't it? A lot of people are just saying, where is that? How, how do I watch it? They didn't even know what, it, what he was ranting on or who he was talking mm. to. <laughs> Um, but maybe that might draw a few few people to. Yeah, well, I was quite worried about him when it when it kicked off. Actually, yeah. you know, when you're a kid and you see mummy and daddy having an argument, and yeah. you're sat there as a spectator, you're like, yeah. I don't know what to do. That's what it felt like. It felt like yeah. you were mummy prodding him, poking him all the time, and yeah. then he was daddy, and he just flipped out and then stormed off. Yeah, and that's he's, what he's done. He said, "Sit down, or, or, or sh I'll shut you up." But I was sat down. Mm. Is that why he didn't shut me up? I don't know, that, that was, yeah, the joke was on him really, yeah. wasn't it? Lois, what are your views on, on um, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a man or not, but like a man wearing gloves <laughs> in sort of February, 15 degrees. I mean, it wasn't even my abuse. I just found it on, on the internet. I just put John Wilkin in and it all came, came As, as you do stuff. most days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw the clip. I didn't quite know what had, had gone on. I didn't realise it was about the gloves. Mm. I mean, I personally probably wouldn't have wore the gloves, but... No. Broken um, every bone in his body. I don't yeah. think I'd have been that bones, bothered about it? your response either. Because you've <laughs> broken a lot of bones, which we'll get on to later, haven't you? But have you broken every bone? <laughs> I mean, I've not even broke a lot of bones. Um, no. I've not broken every bone. I've, I've had muscles. bad injuries, yeah, from, yeah. yeah. But every bone is impressive. Yeah. He brought up in East Hull. He makes out like yeah. it's Beirut. Is East Hull that bad? I don't <laughs> no, know. I don't if, think if there it's are quite... people from East Hull who listen, I mean, I've, I've been to the farm where he was. He grew up. I've been to West Hull. Beautiful. I mean, West Hull's lovely. But Rye Hill is where he's from. Beautiful part of the world. Lovely family. Doesn't he come from? Isn't I mean Phil. Is a, is a pig farmer. I thought they had they money had, themselves. They had a pig, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah they had a farm and a pig. <laughs> so he doesn't come. He doesn't come for money. Um, I think they've had. A, he had a nice he's got a lot of money now, hasn't he? With oh, Sky yeah, and all the things yeah, that he's yeah, doing. Yeah, big time. Yeah. He gets paid uh, about six grand. He does about eighteen podcasts, doesn't he? That's yeah. One yeah. of the reasons he's not here. But yeah, <laughs> if you're just tuning in now, John Wilkin has left the podcast, which is um, we are still processing the news. We don't know how to sort of to deal with that. It's quite you know yeah. sad. It's been a good run. Yeah, he said some funny things at times. Kyle M or Phil Clark potentially. Phil Clark, yeah. Who else? Um, Steve O would be good. Ooh, Luke Gale. Luke Gale, yeah. Yeah, Lois. Lois this could be an audition options. for Lois. I mean, you're putting the pressure on now. Take your chance. Yeah. Take your chance today. <laughs> yeah. um, it's quite yeah. awkward because I'm just there's just an empty seat next to me, isn't there? Mm. Where John would would normally Plenty be. Plenty room for your ego though. Yeah, <laughs> and you might say a, bit, a few more words today. Maybe, as well. yeah, we'll see. You can say John's words. Yeah. Today, yeah. Um, by the way, Carlos. Shuttleworth, I think, got the wrong end of the stick when he was um, talking about Harrow. What did Carlos though? Well, he says, now Wilkin talks shit like he went to Harrow. Thought Phil Clark was a fruitcake, but Wilkin taking it to another level these last few weeks. <laughs> Phil Clark gets a lot of shit, doesn't he? Mm. Yeah. That, I like Phil. Yeah, I do. I prefer him to John, actually. I think he's a human and a job, isn't it? Yeah, I think you've got to be a fruit fruitcake. Yeah. Um, also, John has been um, upsetting a lot of the Wakefield fans, and I wanted it's a shame he's not here today because he has, if you're just tuning in, left the podcast officially. <laughs> um, mm. We're waiting for a statement from his legal team. We have had th legal threats before, Mark, haven't we? Yeah. From we close uh, legal <laughs> representation of John. But um, yeah, he's, uh, I mean, Lois, are you aware of the time when he um, sort of called out Mark Applegarth? Yeah, I remember it. I said on he Twitter. didn't know who he, I said he called him out, he didn't know who he was, but he sort of, yeah. He, John yeah. called out himself. Did you see that? I did see it, yeah. yeah. Are you asking what I think about that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds like he's putting yeah. you on the spot. Don't here. hold back there. He's not um, here. He, he's not going to come for you today. Yeah, I just don't think I'd ever try and say anything nasty about someone. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think he just said, I don't know who he is. But what, 
the reason this is topical today, is, and he had to do an apology on a, someone's phone yeah. outside the stadium. It, it wasn't an I apology, think it was, was it? Yeah. it was called something. A confirmation statement. Confirmation <laughs> statement. <laughs> Clarification like, statement. I've been an naughty sorry, boy. Not yeah. Sorry, It's not an apology, but yeah. I'm saying. We'll send all the, the crew down, the cameras, and Jeff with his iPhone <laughs> 3 <laughs> to film it and put it on Sky Sports News. Um, but he has been upsetting a few Wakefield fans on social media. Um, who A lot of them think he has an agenda against the club. Maybe he does. Um, Stephen Ross says, is it just me or others getting sick of hearing from John Wilkin? Arrogant, narcissistic fuckwit. Um, he's never done he's never done anything wrong, don't you know? Um, Steve Skidmore says, it's not a bloody rocket science at the bottom of the league, Wakefield. What an intelligent chap. Duh. Well, to be fair, Wake, you've been piss poor. So you're just saying it as it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, there were many agreeing with him. And Phil Taylor yeah. says such a smug, Phil the arrogant Taylor. twat. Yeah, I think it is the dart, the dartist. The data. Uh, <laughs> he says, don't know why Sky employ him. He's certainly no export. Just export. Uh, just export. A, export. Carlsberg <laughs> export. <laughs> just, again, the word narcissistics come in. Just a narcissistic, yeah. bitter ex-pro. So it's a shame we can't get a response from John. But obviously at this stage, we would have to say, because obviously if you're tuning in, he has left the podcast, but he's right. he's has the right to reply. Um, um, yeah. And... You know that he'll have to do in a, in a confirmation statement. <laughs> yeah. So get your iPhone three ready. <laughs> uh, by the way, we're up for an award, Lois. Did you know that? Yes. Did you? No, you did. You're like, you're <laughs> a terrible liar. I didn't know. Come she on, looked to the left. Did she body, like, body language oh, expert? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are up for the sports podcast of the year in the rugby category. Class. <laughs> <laughs> the rugby league category. No, no, it's just all rugby. Oh yeah. Yeah, and the, I think there were only two or three rugby league um, podcasts in there. There's a women's rugby league podcast. Yep. There is a another rugby I think league a, podcast. Like a, just a general rugby league, is it, including Australia. I can't remember. And then us, which is the best one. Um, so please vote for us. Sportspodcastgroup.com. Yeah. Just put yeah. that in. Only vote browser. if you're going to vote for us. Yeah, that's what we usually <laughs> say, don't we? Yeah. Only review if it's five stars. Five stars. Only vote for this category if it's for us. Yeah. So there you go. Sportspodcastgroup.com. We won't win, but there we go. Um, Lois, let's talk yes. about you. Enough about John Wilkin. Everyone thinks he's a prick, and um, he has left the podcast. Um, let's let's talk. Uh, cause I, 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 we've met loads of times before, but I've yep. never really asked you a lot about your childhood. Okay. Um, you're way a, back. Le- <laughs> you're a Leeds girl. You're from, you're from East Leeds. Is that as rough as East Hull? Um, <laughs> East Leeds is a lovely place. Um, so I, yeah, I'm from Leeds. Mm. I played rugby at East Leeds. So. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in, in and around that area, but that was my first rugby league club, so East mm. Leeds. Um, probably I have great rivals with places like East Hull. It's known as a tough place to go and play rugby, but that's because we all love rugby. Do you want to um, call out East Hull at the, to give them this chance? Now? Uh, absolutely Look not. Look down no. one of the cameras. And <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying, um, yeah, they probably have some great rivals between East Leeds and East Hull, but um, in terms of the fact that they have great rugby players and really competitive teams, and they make it a place that you don't want to go because you know you're going to have a great game. Mm. and. Uh, be competitive, but so yeah, that Danny, was my Danny, first rugby club. Danny Maguire's from East Leeds, yeah. Danny it? Maguire, yeah. Chris yeah. Clarkson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at Kelsey that. Gentles in the women's game. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, and what was the the household like then? Was it a rugby mad house? Um, yeah, a little bit. So, mum, uh, my dad was um, always into rugby. Um, mum got into rugby from marrying dad, and then um, I was actually playing football. My brother was playing rugby. We we're only like seven, mm. and my mum used to have to drop one off, pick the other one up, and and sort of like swap. And I was just there as my brother was finishing rugby and uh, the coach at the time was called Keith Petman and he said, um, one, up, one down, do you want to play? And I think they were playing something like Bulldogs and I was like, yeah, whatever. And I was thinking about it, he didn't even need an extra number. I think he just thought I looked bored and, and have a go. And I, I jumped in and I just really liked it. I thought it was something that I'd never got out of sport in terms of it being so different. And the fact that there weren't many girls there, I liked that it was sort of like a little bit out of the out of the ordinary, not doing something that everyone else was doing. And um, I never really looked back. And and you you now I think you're 31 aren't you? Not yes. that you should ever give a woman's yeah. age away. However, it's just yeah, a little Wikipedia, so anyone can find <laughs> it out. Um, but what what was that like then? Being seven years old, women's rugby in Leeds was that was it commonplace at the time? Was it? And there weren't many places you could get involved in that. No, no. So I played at East Leeds until I was um, about 11. Then you have to move off and um, play in an all girls team, so you can't play with the lads anymore. And I always remember my last game with the lads and they made a big deal about it, the fact that I couldn't play in that team anymore because that was, you know, like my place that I'd found. I loved rugby, I loved the team, I loved East Leeds, I loved that environment. Um, but then you've got to move off and play in an all-girls team, which is, is fine, but there weren't really many. So I then moved over to a team in South Leeds um, called Middleton Marauders. 
Um, and like at the time, it were a big deal. My dad were like, can't believe you're going to play in a team in South Leeds. That's like East Hull, West Hull. Traitor. Yeah, like going south of the river. <laughs> so yeah, I went and played over for a team there to play in an all girls team. But I had to take a year out because they were sort of like didn't have the numbers and it sort of started to build a little bit. Um, the coaches over there were great and really passionate and, and managed to get it off the ground for us, luckily. But at that time, you were sort of travelling and playing against teams like Chorley over in Lancashire and there weren't often teams that you could play on your doorstep, which the girls have now. So, so yeah, moved over and played an all-girls team and, and, um, and managed to continue to progress. But the game's in much of a better place now in terms that the girls can play a lot more accessible and there's mm. so many more teams to play for them as well. Would, what about you, though? Did you like about rugby league you talked about you know playing football as a kid and yeah. then you know bulldog we all know yeah. what that was like but was it the contact did yeah. you did you enjoy um, that at seven not necessarily the contact because i wouldn't say as a player i was the the, the toughest player and and <laughs> the one who would go and absolutely whack someone but i did like the competitive edge of you can get a look like you can be aggressive i like mm. that even at um, seven yeah oh yeah I, yeah i probably yeah i just bit of a hothead like not in a bad way <laughs> but just I like that competitive side and I like the fact that when I went back to school not everyone was playing it and you know particularly girls and I've liked that as as, a, as an adult like getting more girls to play it recognizing that they can you know book the trend they don't have to go play netball or hockey or football tennis whatever play something different be different and recognize that actually everyone can have a place in rugby, rugby league whether you're you know the toughest the fastest the smartest there's everyone's welcome and it's it's got a place for everyone and I think that I found my confidence and my sort of place to belong within sport in rugby league and there's so many other options and opportunities for other girls to do that as well which is, is great. And what were you like as a kid? Because I, I'd, I'd envisage a seven-year-old, a, a girl playing in an, an all-boys rugby league team, you must need quite a strong character to kind of be against all the lads and kind of hold your own and kind of represent yourself in, in when they probably didn't look down on you a little bit, I'd say. Maybe. Yeah, um, I don't really remember it too much, to be honest. Like, obviously, I don't I never really thought of myself as a kid, but I guess that I just didn't really care a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I had, I just always remember the lads really looked after me, and I think that they liked having me in the team, and I really respected that. So I always felt a massive amount of support from the lads, and I think that if anyone ever took took the piss out of me, they'd literally go, "Well, hang on, give her the ball." And I think because they knew I were all right at it that was okay because it will not like they had to look after me. I could look after myself in terms of I could I could play the game all right. Um, so they enjoyed the other lads sort of like realising, stop stop being a div, you know, she's a girl, <laughs> but she she can play. So just Were you a bit of a, a, a tomboy? Did you have lots of girls mates? Girl <laughs> mates <laughs> yeah, no, I was a tomboy, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I only say that because yeah. I know you've told me I that can see, I, Yeah, I can see a photo of me now like playing for East Leeds. Like, yeah, I was a tomboy. My mum hated it. Like, if I ever had to go to like a wedding or anything, I didn't want to wear any of the girly clothes, which is... Put your Leeds kit on. Is, yeah, <laughs> I, like literally, like, I would rather be in a tracking. Like, sometimes that, like, I like dressing up in, in like clothes that you're going out and stuff, but yeah, I was definitely a tomboy back then. My yeah. That's brilliant it. though. I think girls these days, I've got nieces, mm. they get they they kind of grow up too young. Like yeah. I think it's normal for kids of either sex just to wear trackies and play whatever sport they want. And I think yeah. the world should move more in that direction rather than stereotyping from a young age that girls should wear dresses and mm. play with Barbies, boys should be football. Just let them do whatever they want. Yeah. What about role models? How important were they and, and who were they for you? Because, I mean, John, who used to be on the podcast and Mark, when, when you were young... <laughs> He's left you, the podcast, Yeah, he? he has left the podcast. Um, but you would have had loads of role models, right? And people yeah. you would have looked up to. And look, you, Lois, as well, in the men's game, would have, in a, in a rugby league house, would have yeah. watched a lot of men's rugby. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of female role models and seeing a pathway for maybe taking it into a profession, what was knocking about? Um, I always remember I went to go watch... Um, I think it was, it, they were Wakefield at the time, I think they were called Wakefield and Bradford Thunderbirds. So there was women's rugby happening out there and there's a load of work going on around um, the heritage of the women's game. Uh, you know, you've got like Brenda Dobeck who gave me my first England cap, who was a former player. Um, Lisa McIntosh, who came and did our shirt presentation. They've just been inducted into the, the Hall of Fame. Um, the players have always been out there, but it's that same old saying, if if you can see it, you can, you can be it. And mm. you didn't get to see it often, like unless I saw it because uh, the RFL asked if we some of the girls wanted to be ball girls. So I went and were a ball girl at that game, but mum and dad were busy enough taking me there and everywhere. They didn't really want to go watch more rugby on a Sunday afternoon when they'd been doing it all through the week and it weren't really promoted. So we only, f you know, you didn't really see it as much. So the girls probably didn't didn't, didn't know that they could be that when they grew up. But um, yeah, I, th th there were that. So I remember that were a turning point for me watching the final at um, Post Office Road um, at Fev, watching, watching their um, final. That were a moment when I saw it and I thought, you know, they're all playing there, you know, women, I want to do that. Um, and then there was always a woman who was at um, East Leeds uh, called Nicola Simpson. 
Um, she did play rugby and she played for, for Great Britain. Um, but in terms of just being like an athlete, she was a strong, strong like woman, like and a, and a great character. She went on to be a firefighter and um, she she always did loads of stuff to keep fit. But I always knew she played rugby, and it's probably quite weird now like, if I've ever heard this because. I don't know. I wouldn't even probably know that. I've never spoke to her. I think my mum once told her, drunk in the in the <laughs> pub, that um, you know, watch my daughter all play for England. And I'm just like, yeah, shut up. It's what mum's doing. <laughs> yeah, but um, it was good for me to see that from a young age that there was someone at that club associated with the club. Um, but also like seeing the women playing that final was like the turning point, and that's what's so good for the girls' game now. That you know, Sky Sports next week, 9th of April, we're playing mm. against York. They'll be able to see that and and turn on the TV, and they can see that there's an actual option option for them to do that and you know up until recently you've had to have other jobs obviously yeah, a lot yeah. of the the female players have what, what were you doing to, to make a living as a kid you know <laughs> when, when you, we've got to, kind of up to seven years old when you're allowed to start working 14, yeah, yeah. 15, what were you up to um so i went to university and i think that i probably wouldn't have gone to university if i didn't play rugby and um, that sounds quite bizarre but i think that i was confident in myself as a person that i i it gave me a lot more so i weren't really academic um I enjoyed sport at school, but other than that, I weren't really a particular academic. But I went on to uni to do sport development, which has allowed me to get into the, the role that I do do now. Um, alongside that, I just had like a Saturday job. I worked at um, BHS, British Film Styles. No I used to love exist. BHS. I used to have one on Dean's Gate, <laughs> didn't they? Manchester. You didn't love <laughs> did. BHS. Did. Did. What did you like about there. BHS? Will, light bulbs. Will, Great light bulbs. Will, <laughs> honestly. you are from money. money. You do yeah, not you shop at you BHS. You didn't play Super League games. You You've didn't break every bone in your body. Asking, do you sell Sit down light bulbs? or I will shut you up. <laughs> You are sat down, Mark, so I won't. Oh, yeah. um, no, no, the great, <laughs> great light bulb section. I worked in the section. actually, so. Yeah, did you? So, yeah. In the Manchester yeah. one? No, 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 no in the Leeds one, yeah. yeah. So I worked in the Leeds one. one but yeah, I was just going to Missed that one, Mark. I, um, I worked there, British and um, stores, it, was, it was dead easy because they were really, they're actually really supportive of the fact that, like, I would change shifts all the time in terms of training and stuff like that. I can imagine that's really important back in the day when the women would take it really seriously because you'd need, you need to train as if you're a full-time athlete, but then you need to have a job. You yeah. need understanding employers to kind of give you a bit of a leg up, wouldn't you? Yeah, and the, and I'm, I always remember the store manager. I went and sat, he just went to her, and she was really supportive. She actually was really into boxing, which helped my case. I think that if it had been someone else, she probably wouldn't have even bothered. But I always remember she was sportish, she was into boxing. She obviously understood that discipline. She got it, and I kind of just said, I know I'm meant to work a nine six, I'm meant to work every weekend, but I need every other weekend off and. Um, I need to finish early at these times because I've got a game and, and I just I just outlined it and I said look it's part of the process I want to go to New Zealand this year and then after that that's what's happening and she understood so they were actually really really good um, obviously it meant I didn't get paid because I was just taking days off and they got cover um, which is absolutely fine but that's just that's just the way it was and I wouldn't have changed it to be honest it, it was good so I did that and then finished uni um, got a job for, for Leeds Rhinos Foundation as a development officer what did you do um, at uni? Sport development, right. so yeah, it's sport Listen development. Said that um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> look, he looks very pretty, doesn't he? Sometimes you got to look and listen in this game. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I did sport development, which um, tied in nicely to getting a job at, at the foundation. Yeah. yeah. So, so was there a, a sort of an awakening moment where you thought? Because I know you obviously. I mean, you, you're getting paid nothing, right? Back then. The, the uh, to play. Yeah. I've never uh, never had anything because that's obviously a topic we're going to get onto about. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Ian Lennigan's had something to say about that, hasn't he? Which we'll get your opinion on later. But there wasn't even contributions in terms of travel and all. I mean, how, you know, when, when you're going from ground to ground and um, and all across the, the sort of northwest of England, mm -hmm. what, <laughs> all for free, all, all down to your parents yeah, and down to um, family and fun. No, I think that we got to a certain point where we're playing with it for England and you got expenses and things like that. Um, it sounds crazy, that doesn't it? <laughs> Play it, it for does, England, you got does, expenses. It does, but it's it's where the game was, and I think I'm I'm a big believer that I've had a lot out of rugby, and and I get that now, and and look. Yeah, it would have been nice to have got paid, but you've got to you've got to trust the process and the trajectory. And you know, hopefully, one day people look back and and I look back at you know Brenda Dobeck and Lisa McIntosh and see how they paved the way for us. Mm. And I think they take a, a massive am amount of pride in the fact that they did that. I hope that you know, it, and it won't happen in really really soon. But I hope that they recognise that we did it because we love it, and that should never change. You should do it because mm. you love it. And yeah, we you know the girls do deserve to be able to make a career out of it. But Rome won't built in a day and. We've got to make sure that we can get it broadcastable and a bit more commercial, and then that will all come. Um, but we just weren't at that point then. And actually, I've, you know, I've been to Brazil, New Zealand, Australia, France. I would have never, as a kid from East Leeds, would have never been to them places. Mm. And I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to go on and, and, and go to uni and, and be in the job that I'm in now and sat here talking to you two. So 
yeah, it's 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 double edged sword, and it, I understand what you're saying. It, it's just a tough one, really. Yeah. We've got to trust the process, I guess. W were you inspired by the idea of potentially being a role model then for a, for another generation? Because that's what you've become. Um, but at the time, did you think you, know, you don't really you think like that? Do you? No, you're no. in the moment, and I just love playing yeah. rugby, and I wanted to win, yeah. and I wanted to play as long as I could, and. Um, I, I look. I, you just play with your mates as well. When you look back, you, I, you just play with your mates. That's the biggest thing I miss now, and I'm sure you probably agree. It's just the environment of playing rugby with your mates and and being able to be competitive. And mm. yeah, so I, I'm. You know, if if that is what I am, then I'd be really humbled by that, and and hope that I can do a good job and many more girls pick up rugby ball. But yeah, that's not the that wasn't the motivating factor. There's a different element, Mark, isn't there, in the men's game? Because obviously, you know, guys boys when they get to sort of 16, 17 and they know that they're good enough to play professional and there are clubs looking at them. Mm. Obviously, money, it'd be crazy to say money's not a motivator. They want to make as much money from a sport that they love, right? But th in yeah. the women's game, obviously, it's different because they're purely doing it for the passion. Well, the passion comes first whether you play men's or, or women's. I think I would have played for better teams for less money, definitely. But it's one of them, it's just a byproduct of the sport that we play the, in the men's game that the money is a factor. But like Lois said, it's a journey, and I think <clears throat> you you can't pick where in the journey you you fit into that sport, and mm. it just coincides with with Lois that these days it's gone from amateur to kind of moving on the way to being professional, and the, the leads are starting to get paid. But fast forward ten, fifteen years, if the girls can be full time professional athletes, that'd be brilliant. You just yeah. got to play your part in the journey, in the process, and and do everything you can to kind of to bring it up to speed quicker. Mm. So you play for Leeds, obviously. Play yeah. for Bradford, yeah. England, Yorkshire. Is that a bit yeah. like Mark's yeah, yeah. England Knights cap? <laughs> <laughs> no. You got how many England Knights caps, Mark? Was it just about just fifty? No, I, I, England Knights is only new in for the, the England Knights is a good cap. Are you trying to throw in the bus? No, no, I was yeah, just asking is. the question. Yeah, yeah. Leeds and it's Bradford. Not play though. for England Knights. Isn't yeah, it? talk about that. I played for Bradford first, and then went to Leeds. That's so that was that's very controversial. Mm. So the the first game that I played, so RFL set up nicely. So. Went to the 2017 World Cup with England, uh, with England, sorry, in Australia, and I'd announced to the girls in the season that 2017 season at Bradford that I'd be leaving and going to Leeds. Oof. Yeah, but I'm a Leeds girl. I work for Leeds Rhinos Foundation, and my, you know, I would have still always made that move. But the defining thing is one, I want to play for my hometown club, and two, how can I work at Leeds Rhinos Foundation as mm. a women and girls development officer and tell girls to get into rugby? And they go to me, where do you play? Bradford. Oh, Rivals, yeah. Yeah. It's like Jamie Peacock it's did the same thing, didn't yeah, it? So Leeds lad started off at Bradford and then went yeah. on. Anyone so give you any stick for that? Bradford, yeah. Do they? Bradford, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got on. death after my first game. Did you? Yeah. 100% you on Twitter. Yeah, like, yeah, on that. Twitter. I will do. What, hold so on, the what first year are we talking game, here? What, sorry? What year are we talking here? 2018. So, right. yeah, so it was, um, I had to report it to the media manager. Yeah, it was quite funny. So, we, we the first game the RFL teed up and I was the ambassador for the RFL so I've moved from Bradford to Leeds. I knew what happened. I'd won the treble with Bradford and Bradford were the, the team at the top and mm. obviously Leeds had set up and everyone thought it was just like a you know, like a bit of a gimmick, like, oh yeah, you can't just set up a team overnight, guys. Um and it were Leeds and Bradford opening game at Odsell. Um and it, yeah, double header, so the men had played before and yeah. then we went out afterwards uh, after the men had played, so a few fans stuck behind and yeah. Someone sent me yeah, someone sent me a death threat on Twitter saying, um, Lois Forsell is a traitor and should be hung until the neck until dead. What? <laughs> I had to send it to the media uh, manager and be like, I'm not really worried, but can we like I don't really think that should be going out. That? I don't know. Was it but, yeah. I mean, I imagine it was what a Bradford was fan. Yeah. But, but, but I love Bradford, by the way, as well. I'm not even getting into that. They were, the they were fantastic. I did love Bradford. My, honestly, like, best times, some of the best memories playing rugby. Mm. Um, the the club got from, massively from, behind yeah. it. it. It was brilliant. But obviously, it was a no-brainer for me, being on, a Leeds girl. Hold on, back to the death threat. So, when, when you look... when you. And I know you're laughing now, and, and oh, it, sounds, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It's well, a bit like... Well, it's on Twitter, isn't it? So, I'm a bit like, oh, that's but a did bit you, much. Did but did you take that with a pinch of salt at the time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have done, but yeah, I don't think. And could you see who it was? I thought it was just a weird alias picture of oh, a pirate the, the, or something. I, yeah, well, I don't know. I can't remember at the time. It wasn't like one that it was definitely them, but yeah. they, they, they sorted it out. I think that the club spoke to Bradford and Leeds mm. spoke to Bradford and sorted it out. But yeah, yeah, it was, it, but, for me, for me, it was class because I was like, people care about women's rugby. Yeah. Like, do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, it shows off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we've gone talking about people not knowing when games are or whatever and actually someone cared that I moved from Leeds to Bradford and Leeds beat Bradford so winner winner is that the way you saw it pretty quickly yeah because it, it never hit better. it never hit personally you never felt no. kind of you know worrying or something no. and there was a one-off they were shouting Judas I was shouting Judas to me <laughs> from the stands yeah 
And then, yeah, because I remember because um, Amy Hardcastle plays at Leeds now and yeah. Shona, who plays at Saints and was at Bradford. So we all played together. And I think I'd seen him at England training in the week, like a couple of weeks after because Amy had hurt a knee in that game and I'd tackled her. And yeah, it wasn't, there's was nothing in it, but it was, you know, obviously I didn't ever want Amy to get hurt and everything. But it was when I think I'd tackled Amy and they were like a break in play. And I could just hear from the stands and shouting, Judas, Judas. And I, and I told Amy and Shona at training a couple of weeks later at England training and they both responded. Who's Judas? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, right, okay. <laughs> but that is good. I mean, obviously the death threat, you can't really laugh at because it's so prominent now, isn't it? And yeah. it's probably becoming more prominent in the women's game. Yeah, yeah, well, probably. it just shows that sport evokes passion, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that's, as an athlete, whether it's men's or women, you want fans to be passionate about what you're doing because mm. it drives revenue, it, it drives people to come to the game. So, yeah, on, on the flip side of it, obviously death, death threats aren't nice, but it shows that yeah. people care and you're out there, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, a, ha a hanging, a public hanging, would be quite a harsh punishment for, for going for Bradford. Yeah, I just think it was a bit steep, to be honest. Yeah, I just, <laughs> at least a slice. I don't know. It what, was in the heat at the moment. Yeah, like maybe put you in the stock, throw tomatoes at you. Yeah, yeah. In Bradford outside Bradford Town yeah, Hall. Yeah. That's fair, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, think about what you've you know. Think about, think what, you've about what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you went to Leeds in in 2018, yeah. you obviously had some some great memories and stuff. Yeah, but when yeah. you look back on your your time at Bradford Leeds, and you mentioned the treble that you won at Bradford, what what are the highlights? Give us a few. You know, what those um, moments you look back on in the, in the nursing home in 30 years' time. 30, 30 years' time? No, let's, let's give six, over. Four, how old are you now, 31? 31, you've already told yeah, everyone that. Already, yeah, you've no, already, already asked that question. That. <laughs> yeah. You listen. listen. I'm just trying to add he's, it he's, no, he's not pretty, no, but he's okay, it but he there's not much going on. When does one go to the nursing home if everything goes all right in life, you know? I mean, I think this is going down. You've got 50. I think we've all got 50. You'd accept a nursing home. You've got 40. It's just a pure, like, it's just a home, like, you know, because your kids are like, oh, should we just send mum to the home? Rocking chair, cards, it's cool. Uno. Is it cool? Yeah. How you can't wait you know? to get to the nursing home. You can't wait you to get to the nursing home. You know, you have to have a few drinks and stuff. Yeah, it's quite an uh, active lifestyle for yeah. you, isn't it? Compared to what so you're go doing on. So what, what will you look back on and think, wow, um, you're super proud of those moments? Um, probably that last that last year in with Bradford in, in uh, 2017, winning the treble. Mm. I actually went to Bradford. Um, so I was playing, obviously, in, in South Leeds, as I mentioned, as an open-age team, but I got, I got selected for England. When I got selected for England, I made the choice that I had to, to move on and play in the top top division. Um, the team I was playing at the time opted to go down, so I moved to Bradford. I moved to Bradford because at the time they weren't really winning any trophies. Um, they were always in the final with, with Wakefield. It were pretty like dominant with two teams being the top teams, but Wakefield always seemed to win, um, and, and, and Bradford n never did. Um, so... I chose to go to Bradford because I wasn't really much in it distance-wise from my house in Leeds. So I, I chose Bradford and went to go play at Bradford and, and we were always the bridesmaids, never the brides. We always missed out on the big finals and it was that last year that we went on and did the treble and um, it, it was just great finishing that year off with the treble, then going to the World Cup um, with England um, and knowing that then was starting a new chapter with Leeds was, was, was class. But yeah, winning those... That, that, I think I had some quite good form in that last year as well that I played at Bradford. Um, so it, it was just enjoyable playing with my mates and then a, a few of the girls were thinking about retirement at the time. So it was just a nice way to sign out and finish out. But I'd say that that was definitely sort of like the, the, the best memory. And then um, going to the World Cup in 2017 was, was brilliant for me. I played in 2013 but weren't probably where I wanted to be or needed to be. And I always just remember going to New Zealand was brilliant, um, a brilliant experience touring New Zealand. I was only, I think, 18. Um, so that was the the moment that I knew I had to really, really up my game if I wanted to be one of the better players in the women's game because we got absolutely bashed about by some of the Kiwi <laughs> girls and played against one of their um, like counties, Manaku, I think they called it, like an island team. We, we drew against them before we'd even play against the Kiwi firms and they were just so physical and I realised that I probably didn't train like an all-round athlete and that was a sort of like flip moment for me in terms of really up in my training. And, That's difficult and though, isn't it? it? I mean, look, I, I, we were taking the piss earlier, weren't we? but if you're popping back to BHS and you've got a job and you've got another who've got family and kids and whatever, yeah. to train like an athlete and, and you find that maybe when you play against yeah. some serious, serious teams. But I think the RFL in England actually so, probably saw that from that point. So I think that after that we came back and we started then getting options to train at, at Sheffield EIS. So I know that sounds ridiculous as well because we're travelling from Leeds to Sheffield to train in the gym with decent um, S&C coaches. But that's, that's what we needed. We needed education. Mm. We needed to start that base and, 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 and build from there. But the game has done that. And, and you know, it does seem daft when, like, you look back at what, what we get now at, at, at clubs and stuff and you think, actually, as an England player, I just trained at Bradford in, like, 
on a Wednesday and then we played on a Sunday. We didn't have any S and C support and we were playing for England. But that's just time, isn't it? Now but I love that over such, it's, and that, that's still been such a short space of time, but you're like, yeah. Oh, look at these girls now all pampered oh, and they've got it all. You don't know what it was like four years ago. <laughs> yeah, I would never say that, but I just think <laughs> I never even think about that because I'm just so proud that where the game's at now and I'd always want every girl that's playing Super League to get the absolute best. But then <laughs> just thinking about it then it is like, yeah. Like it is so much better now, um, but so it should be. And, and what were good. the other big challenges then that that you face that perhaps <coughs> female players don't have now? Um, uh, I don't know. It's probably it's probably the same but different. I just think that there's so much support now. I didn't know it were a challenge at the time because we'd never got it. Mm. If that makes sense. But now looking back, when the girls, so like if you're at Leeds, for example, they train on a Tuesday and Thursday. They've got S and C support. Um, they've got access to the gym. They've got the field session. When we trained at Bradford, we just had the field session and. You probably, you know, like as an England player, I had a programme that I'd do in my own time out external, um, which was fine. But actually think about if you had an SSC with you two or three times a week, how much better you would be within a gym and how much that might change your, change your game. But like I say, towards the back end of my career, it got a lot better. Um, but now where it's at is it's, it's class and, and it's good. It's what the game needs. And that's why we've seen like the past couple of years, the game come on so so much and the game has been a lot more competitive and, and the players, you know, being better athletes. It's I love watching on and, and just go, I wish, I wish I had an extra few years and mm. well, that might have made. But yeah, it's, it's good. When you think back at your career and I, and I interview a lot of footballers and always there's always a trend and a theme that comes up that like, oh, I could have had more, even though they yeah. won loads of trophies. They're never content. And even yeah. the most successful ones will say to me like, hmm. Yeah, I just I should have been better. You know, Robbie yeah. Fowler, for example, one of the best footballers we've ever seen on this planet, just said, "Yeah, it just should have been so much more." That's why he's good. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you obviously need that that edge, and and yeah. we'll get on and talk about your injury and how it all ended. But when you look back at your career, does it feel complete? Does it feel like the dreams were all ticked off? Oh no, 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 because yeah, no, not really. I'm I'm incredibly grateful for um, everything that rugby gave me and and everything that I managed to achieve. But yeah, I definitely sort of had to 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 end the end my career short and yeah who knows what might have been in the next couple of years but who knows don't help anyone so I have to look at like what I've got now in terms of a coach but that made me laugh obviously saying about the what what everyone's never content and do you remember when Sean Wayne came on uh, when we were doing yeah, it yeah and he yeah. said never I think what he said was I'll never be happy but what he actually meant was I'll never be content yeah. and that's like a massive thing that I took yeah, that in terms never happy, <laughs> that I'll he, never he, he did yeah I'll never be happy but what he meant is like I'll never be content like there's always he said that he'd won the grand final and he's yeah. sat in the bar and a beer thinking about what he wants to do next pre-season mm. and I get that as, as, as a person and a player I just think I always want that little bit more not because I want more because I just wonder what else you can achieve yeah and the girls take the piss actually a little bit about that because um, you know the song that doesn't impress me much yeah. night away and apparently that's, that's, that's you. yeah apparently that's me yeah <laughs> the, one of the girls like started singing and bopping to it so it's on the gym playlist now and it came on the, the bus on the way home the other day and they all just look at me and giggle and yeah. I just think well someone's got to have that job <laughs> but, but then that's a standard that's an expectation right and you've had that from the seven year old girl that started playing at East Leeds have you that doesn't just grow in you does it that's in you from the beginning or not um, I think I just want to be good at what I do and. I want, you know, if I want other people to achieve their potential as well, and I just think that there's always a little bit more in there. If you if you just settle and sit back and are comfortable with that, then mm. you I, don't, don't I just don't know top, how you do you? that. You don't, don't reach really. the top if if you've got that mindset yeah. of settling for just mediocrity. I think you've always got to strive for something else, for, something for more, next. yeah, and yeah. bring the best out of yourself. Mm. I think um, I'm a big believer. In you can you can only control what's in, what's on your plate you can't control injuries external factors other other teams performance you've got to just look after your own house and mm. <clears throat> having worked with Sean I know exactly what he's like in terms of that um striving f for 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 greatness really yeah. um and I think as a coach I think it's really important when 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 you celebrate your wins and and when you kind of drive a team hard to kind of improve and I think as long as you've got that mindset that the tops, the on, the only place where you want to go. That that that's that's the main thing. And, really. and I think that people don't mind it if you've got it for yourself. So like Sean Wayne obviously does like he always wants it to be better. And I think that because he leads on that, it's it's okay. But it did make me laugh like hearing him say that because then obviously we won, we won the grand final last year and mm. I think I enjoyed it for all of like twelve hours and then yeah. we're like oh god let's go again then eh? Yeah. Well, and you can imagine the type of person that Sean is having yeah. come so close with England as well, how much that will grate on him. I mean, one thing that stood out, we did him a few times on podcasts and on Inside Super League was he said he was in the, the, the Wigan gym at the training ground and he would sometimes come in and he would just smell a rat if the music wasn't loud enough, if he didn't feel something. 
And then he'd say, the next time I walk through here, I want blood coming out of the calluses. I want everyone lifting another 20 <laughs> plates on each side. I can imagine Sean saying that. Yeah, that's, that's in, that's in yeah. you. That's an instinct, isn't it? The, the difference between you two is that you got to choose, Mark, when you retired. You, you knew when the moment was right. You know, mm. you'd, you'd had a great kind of twilight years at Salford and you'd, no, you did. You got to a grand final, you got to a Challenge Cup final. Like, not a lot of people do that. And, and having already played at a big club. But for you, Lois, it was forced upon you, right? 2019, ACL injury. He didn't have much choice. How, yeah, how yeah. difficult was that time for you? Um, so I actually did. I I injured my knee in 2018. So I've signed for, <laughs> came back from the World Cup in November, December 2017. Started pre-season with Leeds in in January. Um, obviously, massive year. Where the first signing, the the captain for the club, um, getting everything off the ground is sort of like part of my day job as well. Um, and we we started playing. We beat Bradford in that opening game at Oddsill, which was that that's one of the best memories. And I'll. I, yeah, that was that was really good just in terms of the amount of pressure that I kind of felt and, and going into that and then ending in that win. It was it was brilliant. Um we then won the Challenge Cup final against Cass at Warrington, um, won the league leaders, but then on the ninth of September I ruptured my ACL, um, playing against St Helens. Um You're twenty seven, twenty eight here. Um uh, good question, probably about twenty seven, yeah, twenty yeah, twenty seven. Young. Yeah, young enough. Um so it's a bad I injury that I know. It is, and the injury wasn't the issue. So I, I did my ACL. I'd, I'd literally, it was, and it's annoying because it was the last couple of minutes of the game. I jumped out of dummy half, um, and I just, I just sidestepped, and I just heard it go, and then um, someone hit me at the same time. Like so, the people just thought I'd gone down for a high, high shot, which I wish I had. Um, but you know, my ACL had gone, which is fine. So I had the, I had the surgery late that year. I think it was about October time. Um, had the, had the surgery October November, um, and then. We're rehabbing the club was amazing, so supportive in terms of obviously the fact that I worked there, I could drop in a little bit more frequent than maybe some of the girls might have managed to if they had a different job. But that were the perks of, of, of working within the sport. And they were really pushing me hard to rehab this injury and it and it just wasn't happening and they'd not really seen anything like it. So it was like going back and forward to the surgeon and saying, Something's not right. They're saying, You're doing too much, you're trying you're trying too hard and I was like Maybe I am. That's the kind of person I am. So went back to the drawing board, but the physios were quite adamant that I wasn't. And I just remember, um, I just I just broke down with the club doctor one day and just said, "Look, this isn't even about rugby anymore." Um, I had, I, you know, I got injured in September. I had the operation. It's now January, end of January, and I still can't even walk properly. Like I can't get the function in my knee that I need to be able to even start on any proper rehab. Um, and he, and he. You know, and, and I just want to be at work and do my job. I can't even do that at the moment, not even thinking about playing, which I was, but I was trying to lay it on stick in terms of like, this is about life as well as rugby. Mm. And um, he sent me for a scan. So he luckily managed to get me in for a scan and I went that, that day. Um, and then I got a phone call that night at about seven o'clock, eight o'clock, um, saying the surgeon wants to see you tomorrow. Um, don't worry, it's just nothing, you know, just wants to take some blood tests. Don't and worry. Then, mm. And then I put the phone down and I was like, all oh, right, okay. I started to look on Google and wonder why they need to take blood tests. And then he texted me and said, oh, and just in case, don't eat anything tomorrow morning. Oh, shit. And then I just thought, but then me being me, I was just like, oh, it's still fine. Like, it, you know, they're just being cautious. So I got up at about nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, had some cereal because I thought I'd be starving if not. And then, um, yeah, I went to hospital and I sat down and he, and he looked at me and the surgeon and he said, right, um, I'd usually say, don't the good news or the bad news, but there's only, there's only, two bits of bad news. The first bit is I'm taking your graft out and the second bit is you're probably gonna have to stay in hospital for a little while. Um, and I got an infection in my femur. So when they'd done the surgery, um, I'd got an infection in my bone somehow. Like a staph infection? Um, it was, yeah, staph A. So yeah. it was similar to like Keith Senior. Um, so <coughs> yeah. I know a lad who's had that done. It ended his career as well. Yeah. <clears throat> the guy Tim Moulton in Australia did his ACL twice and his second, in, second reconstruction. He got a staph infection. Yeah. He never played again. No, so and it sounds so stupid, and that's what I struggled with at the time when I said they were hanging my boots up. I don't think people got it. I was like, oh, you've done your ACL and you're retiring. So mm. <laughs> that 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 wound me up because that's not the kind of person I am. But yeah, I ended up. Um, so he took the he took the graft out. Then um, I had a pick line put in for the infection. So like obviously I was talking to Keith like a lot about it when he did it. It was really crap for him because he were constantly having to be in and out of hospital on a drip and stay in hospital while I had the drip. I went home and had a line in my arm that went to my heart that I could have the antibiotics in every day. So the nurses just came and did it every day. Um, but I ended up having seven ops on these antibiotics. Seven? Yeah. Seven, on 
Yeah. Nearly as many as John Wilkin. Se- seven off. Seven yeah. off. Seven. <laughs> Twelve off Wilkin. Yeah. No, um... Sit down or I will shut you up. That's, what, that's your next line, lads. I'm just feeding yeah, I'm not, you. I'm not doing that. Look, operations <laughs> do make you argue. Um, no, I had seven operations and the pick line in for a couple of months to have the antibiotics. And mm. then, um, yeah, it was sort of like come back to what we could do after that all cl- calmed down. But at the time, I probably didn't realise how, how serious it was. But obviously, if you can't, if you don't get an infection that's in your bone under control and it keeps going, then it, it, it's pretty hit, touch and go, which I didn't really realise. I just cared about playing rugby and probably a good thing, to be fair, because I didn't actually really, I wasn't that bothered. I just kind of let me know when I can start rehabbing and then we'll go from there. But um, on the back of all that, it was actually, I can't reattach your ACL to your leg because you've not got the bone there to reattach it to. Oh, so if we're going to do that, you'd have to have a bone graft. If you have a bone graft, you haven't got enough bone in your hips, so we'll have to use a bone donor and that then would make it more likely that you could get the infection again. And if you get the infection again, you shatter that bone. So what what do we do? And yeah, I made the decision. So the girls played on in 2019, in October 2019, they played the grand final that Thursday. So they played on the Friday. That Thursday I'd had my my um, last consultation with the surgeon and said, look, let, let's just call it a day. Did the severity of the injury make the the retirement easier? Because you would have been left with a decision that if you keep on going with trying to fix it so you can play again, you might actually do some serious harm to your, to your leg. Did, um, did, it make, did it make you feel grateful that you just want to get through it and be able to live a normal, happy life and be able to walk around? Yeah, a little bit. And I think the fact that day-to-day I struggle with money a little bit makes it easier because, like, I sometimes go to myself, you know, people play without an ACL, but then I go, well, people play without an ACL, but then, I'd, you know, I've got arthritis in my knee and I actually physically... I'd be like a heavy goods vehicle trying to change direction. Like I don't, I know that I couldn't play. as a condition from Yeah, just from the operations and from like the infection in my knee. So it's just arthritic and it's, you know, it's not stable because there's no ACL there even when I do strengthen it. It's just not great. Like, and I know that, because I I keep fit and I I try to, you know, make sure that I'm I'm looking after myself. But I know that I couldn't play how I'd want to play. And I think that's the thing that helps me is that, I wouldn't want to come back and be less than what I were, and mm. I don't think that I could push to be better than, you know, I, I wanted to be the best, and I, I don't want to come That'd back. That would be more frustrating be okay. if you did come back and you weren't the player you were. Yeah. I, so, you'd hurt that. Yeah, I would as well. What was that, that week like then when you accepted that you had to retire and the people and the people you told and were there tears? Were there, what was the emotion? Yeah, yeah. I found it, like, quite difficult. I felt, being really honest, I felt like I'd lost a bit of who I was. Like, I've... I've been that girl at East Leeds when I was seven all the way through. Like, you know, when you go to a party and someone goes, oh, hi, Lois, how's rugby? Mm. And I'm like, all oh, right, yeah, not about me then. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Mm. about that. Yeah, so it's just everyone asks you about rugby. Like, that is mm. that is only what people think you want to talk about and what they're interested in talking about. And then I was like, well, I don't play rugby. Like, yeah. what are we I do doing? like other things. I do other yeah, stuff. Like, I'm not and just I'm, defined yeah. by the one sport. But that, that was what everyone spoke to you about. So you yeah. found, like, for the next year, it would be like, just having to tell everyone that you've retired and that... Do you get this one now? Yeah. Do you miss it? <laughs> I get that all the time. Yeah. Do you miss playing rugby? A little bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. How long you got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was... Yeah, so it was It was good that it was that severe that kind of... I could, but then I also found, found it hard that people probably didn't actually recognise what sort of trauma had led to that point as well a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that is a traumatic time. When you, and, and, and you said, what, five minutes ago that people just think, oh, you did your ACL and you still have the ego don't you as a player thing and i don't want people to think i'm soft yeah it's kind of what the message i got from that but the the the, the <laughs> struggles bit. the struggles mentally they, were they difficult how long did they last are they still there were they... um no well yeah it was obviously like a men, like a mental battle and adjusting and stuff like that but um fats at, at leeds is the welfare officer he was class so obviously if i spoke to my mum mum would be like nigel johnson yeah, yeah, I don't he's love it. yeah i love him fat so um if i spoke to my mum my mum would just be like just rant at me like you're lucky you still have your leg and just go at me from a loving place mum but but not like, from an athlete's point from of like view. yeah she understood how much it meant to me but her her point of view was she was just happy that she had a healthy happy daughter mm. and my point was that i couldn't play and that was everything that i'd ever done so niger just listen and yeah mm. it, it was good so sometimes just having someone to listen is important yeah, yeah. because you can't reach the the pinnacle of your sport without putting emotionally putting so much into it yeah and then when it's taken away you need to kind of let that yeah. process happen i can't even remember what i even said to niger to be honest and and i just remember that i'd just be able to sit in his office and walk out feeling a lot lighter whether that i'd, I'd had a cry or i just had a rant at him 
whatever it'd be, it, whatever it would be, I just knew that I could just leave it there. And it was just funny because I'd never really worked with someone who was like in welfare or like counselling. It just made me laugh. I knew I knew what we were doing. It was just leaving space for me to talk. Mm. I knew what we were doing, and I still kept going. So mm. <laughs> yeah, it, it was good. And yeah, I found it tough adjusting, and um, still do like some. You know, still do have days where you just wish you could have one more game, or you know, I think that's natural. But I know that I can't, and I'm really really happy that I've been given an opportunity by the club and and the group of girls that I work with to to be involved in rugby in a different capacity and. That's been great for me as well. You've done so much in a short space of time, in a in what four or five years since since retiring, um, post your your playing career, and, and you actually became the, the RFL's first women's player ambassador as well. Before we get talking about what you're doing at Leeds yeah, and yeah. coming up with England, um, how important was that? And, is, and it was was that a bit like entering a room full of dinosaurs? Did you feel like you had a big role to play with the RFL and representing the women? Um, I, f I felt like I had a big role to play in terms of my friends and, and the, the girls that I played the game with. Um, I just wanted to represent them well and make sure that we started to pave the way for, for us and I think we've definitely done that and they've, they've brought on, on more people in that role. Like Obviously Jodie Cunningham was the World Cup ambassador and she now works at the RFL and stuff like that and I think that you know myself and Jodie have always thought that we've got um, a big role to play in making sure that we're really good advocates for the women's game and, and we put it in the right places and, and, and try and get the best out for all of the girls that are playing and, and hopefully we've done that a little bit and, and, and long may that continue. But yeah, it was it was more probably in terms of where I sat within the game. I obviously worked for Leeds as well, so it were easy that you know some of the girls can't just take an afternoon off of work to go and do a season launch, but I can because I'm employed by a club who are really supportive of the women's game. Mm. And my time was a little bit... Um, like yeah, it was it was better to use as well, I guess. So it was good. Mm. Do, do you feel like there's a lot more the RFL can do for the women's game? Is that something that you're going to push them to do? Back then, no. I think it was like, how can I support them do that? And it, you know, how can I be a sounding board? So um, Tom Brindle, who's the I think he's a general manager of women's Super League now. Back then, I think he was head of growth and participation. But you know, he's been a massive influencer in the traje trajectory of the women's game. He had a real big vision um, and he's pushed it to this point so far. And there's a lot more we can do to change because the game's ever evolving. But that's not to say that the RFL are pushing hard. That just means that we've got to keep adapting and we've got to keep growing because there's going to be hurdles this year, next year that we need to, to sort of navigate and be better with. And ultimately it's going to get tougher. Like there is going to have to be look looking at like, you know, money and commercialisation. That makes it a different challenge from the couple of years before. But you know the RFL push it hard, and and I think we can tell from the growth that we've had that they they have got the women's game um, in their interests and, and making it as big as we can. Because for the game, the women's game is such a important part. It's got the most most growth within it because um, it's in its infancy. Mm. And it's a massive family sport, rugby league. So when you unlike other sports, you go to a match and you'll see families, you'll see mums, daughters watching as well as m m dads and sons. So I think yeah. it's really important that really push it forward as, as best we can. Was the dream always, I mean, I'm talking pre-2018-19, the nasty injuries, to be a head coach? I not even thought about it, if I'm being totally honest. Obviously, I like coaching because of my job um, as a development officer, but I think I'd be lying to say that I'd, I'd thought past, you know, I wanted to be successful with Leeds as a player and I'd, I I just hadn't thought about it, if I'm, if I'm being really honest, because I, I, think, I think my plan was 2021 World Cup as a player and... I'll think about what look that looks like in maybe 2020, but you know we're only in 2018, and I and I did my ACL, so I'd not even really thought past 2021 World Cup as a player, really. How did you find that transition from player to coach? Oh, it's tough. It, it was tough. It still is tough, and you know, like it's. So we do like a Y box at Leeds, so we basically get together in pre-season and talk about um, you know what our motivating factors are and why we are, or I know why we want to do everything we can be to be to be a great player for that club and we learn a lot about each other on that and it's important for me because I think that you know we've had a lot of new signings this year um, and as a coach I feel like I'm maybe not I don't know the same coach as they've had elsewhere because within that team that I coach I've also played with all the like a lot mm. of the girls like mm. I'd say a large percentage of Is that does that benefit you sometimes can it go against you and others? I think I think both <laughs> I think sometimes it's really good and then sometimes it can be more difficult um, but when I took the job um, so I retired in 2019 and in early 2020, um, just before everything happened with, with COVID, obviously Cuff Board stepped down as head coach um, partway through pre-season and then him and, and Kev Sinfield and Ben Jones met with me and outlined their plan that they wanted me to, to take over if I was keen and 
they were really good and been supportive in terms of saying it's not, you know, it's this is a long term plan. We don't expect you to be the finished article in year one and year two. And I felt supported in that. Um, but they said that they thought that I was I was best for, best person for the job and would to do it. And it, it scared me, but at the same time, I knew it was a great opportunity and something that were going to challenge me. And I needed that after after finishing playing. Um, and so when I when I took it, I just sort of like said to the girls, look, obviously, it's. It, you know, it's, it's got massive perks and for some of you, you might be a little bit anxious as I am as a former player taking on a head coach's role, but um, all, I'll, all I'll always offer you is 100% honesty and put the team first. And if I do them two things, we won't go far wrong and, and that's what I will pride myself by. And I think I've done that. And that meant that sometimes I've had to have like really difficult conversations with people who, my friend, teammate, former teammate, and now I'm head coach and part of the squad that I'm wanting to achieve with and we'll have to have some difficult conversations and sometimes they've gone really well and sometimes they've gone really bad but I think we've got the mutual respect that that just has to happen for the team to, to achieve. As so. long as you can look yourself in the mirror and know you've done the right thing for the team and the club that's all you can it's do. It's got to do the harder thing haven't you? You've yeah. got to, it's so easy to think oh, just, I can't yeah. be asked doing that today yeah. or yeah. ever. I won't the easy have option it. doesn't So the easy doesn't I know that the easy option is easy for me but no one else and it'll 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 come undone for the others. Yeah. So I've just got to hold myself accountable to doing that. Have any of the girls said, you've changed? <laughs> <laughs> that was always one. When a player went for, to be an assistant coach, we'd always go, oh, you've changed. Especially if you were tight with them, if they were your yeah. mates. No, I don't think they'd say I've changed. I think they'd say that I hold back. So like, I went for a drink with them after the grand final last year, but up until that point, I wouldn't, wouldn't like, so I went to Newcastle, so we drove to, um, we drove to Newcastle, so we train on Blythe Beach because we've got three girls. We've now got four, but they travel from the northeast every Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. Possible. Yeah, Possible. so like fair, like fair commitment, fair like the class. To be fair, we call them the seaside girls, Geordies, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. They love it, and I said to the girls, right, we're going to go train over there for Magic Weekend. We'll train in the morning. You, you guys, if you want, go do staff so uh, play a social. Sorry, go watch the game. You can all stay at Sam. Sam put them all up in like <laughs> garden house. You must have big house to know, but they all went out and watched Magic Weekend, and they were all giving it. Oh, why are you not coming? You're boring. boring. You're boring. Yeah. Like, it's not coming. Yeah. Like, can you imagine if you look go? You need to do what you want to do on your weekend and not yeah. feel like I'm looking at you and, yeah. and thinking. But you have to selection. have that separation, right? Don't you? Could be yeah. like Frank the Tank, and you'd be like leading <laughs> yeah. the charge. Great film. And then yeah. on yeah. Tuesday at training, everyone's like, "Well, it's not even just about me. One, I don't want to be doing something, and I'm going. Oh, do you remember when you did this? Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want them to feel like they've got a hold back because if they want to go and get absolutely, yeah, pie-eyed, whatever they want to go do, they don't want to think, "Well, she's thinking that I'm going to be running a slow bronco next yeah. Thursday." But like, it's not as if you're coaching them here in your forties and fifties. Yeah. You're still a young yeah. girl yourself, aren't you? you know, yeah. So, you so that it is hard because. Like they're my friends as well as you know, so yeah. Um, I recognise they need their own space. I need my own mm. space, mm. but we definitely have that shared environment where, if after we've gone final or whatever, we can we can have it. When drink. I was at Saints, Nathan Brown used to always come out with us for a drink, and mm. he'd have like a couple of hours, and then he'd backdoor it, and have, he'd have his pals with him, so that when he backdoored it, he used to go off with his pals. Mm. And then one time we're in Saints. And then we were supposed to say in sets, but we went to Liverpool and we bumped into it like one o'clock in the morning and he couldn't see and he was so embarrassed. <laughs> he was absolutely arsehole. <laughs> well, we all absolutely hammered him. He thought he'd gone to Liverpool yeah, to get away from you. Yeah, but he couldn't. He found him. <laughs> so as we sit here on the, the eve of a new season, yeah. um, and if you're watching on YouTube, just to update you as well, John Wilkin has officially left the podcast. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's worth reminding sad, people, sad isn't it? Sad times, end it of an era, isn't it? Starting, I'm starting to process it a little bit more now. It's been like an hour, mm. I've had a little few... Yeah, I think Kyle emotions. could be good. Kyle or Phil. Yeah, Kyle, if you're out there, you've you've got my number. No, I don't think he does. No, no. Uh, we'll 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 come to you. Yeah. Um, it looks like we're almost in a skiing chalet, isn't it? Behind Lois, if mm -hmm. you're looking at that camera, it's sort of we're not in Switzerland. We're in the bowels mark of um, Lancashire Cricket Club, mm -hmm. Old Trafford. Yeah. Um, how do you feel, Lois, about the new season? The fact that you're going to try and defend your title. Um, so much excitement and we'll get on to the, the payment side of things as well but yeah. another season huge progression in the women's game and it's all ahead of you months ahead starting Easter Sunday against York yeah grand final rerun so yeah we're, we're playing at Head and Lee on Sky um, <coughs> against York but exciting the girls have had a long pre-season so some of the girls have been training since um, like late Nove uh, no beginning of November so we had the girls who went on international duties came in and did some some like conditioning and, and, and strength and strength training. That's a big um, pre-season. It is, yeah. So they had like a six week block before Christmas, had two weeks off, and then we all got back together in January after the Christmas break. Um, we did another six weeks, had a week off, another six weeks. So we have we have chunked it up, which has, has helped, I think. But everyone, 
everyone who is there wants to play. Mm. So that's what they're all, all waiting to get to. So we had a pre-season game uh, last weekend um, against Warrington because our game against Wigan got called off for snow. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're excited to go and, and yeah, we are defending our title, but you know, that's what everyone's there for. If you win, that's your trophy to attain. And if someone wants it, they've got to work really hard to come and take it off you. And that's what you've got to have in your mindset that you're keeping it. And if anyone wants to try and take it, they'll have to make it as hard as possibly can. But yeah, it's exciting. Um, Increased TV coverage, three double yeah. headers on Sky Sports this season, bigger, bigger crowds. Yeah, we're playing all of our league games at Headingley um, as double headers. So, and that makes a big difference. Like last year, one of the highlights for me was um, walking off towards the south stand because we get changed in the south stand. There's changing rooms that side and at the north side. Um, so we walk off towards the south stand, and the girls were all going to say like thanks to the south stand um, supporters, and just hear like just seeing them and hearing them and just watching the girls walk off. It was kind of like a pinch yourself moment of. Yeah, it's brilliant that because I remember when I was coming through in the reserves or the the under 18s under 21s, we'd play before the first team. And yeah. I remember playing for Wigan against Leeds. Um, and a curtain raiser, and by the time the f the, f the all the fans come in, there can be five, ten thousand there, and yeah. it's great for them to see you play, whether it was young lads in the academy or or the women's game, and it's great. It's great for the fans to see. It's great for for the, the, everyone who's who's competing. It's putting that, those women in that environment, yeah, isn't they, it? It puts them in the spotlight huge. for a finite period of time, and it can be that little glimpse for a young girl seeing seeing Amy Harcastle score a full length try or whatever it is, and that mm. might just spark something in them to really take up the game and, and, and push them forward. And as cliche as it sounds, and I know it sounds awful, but like that that moment of walking off, seeing that, that gratification of terms of, you know, working so hard in the gym, like they ultimately play for themselves mm. and they play because they're passionate and they want to play rugby and they want to play rugby well. But seeing that, it, they're just them moments that just sort of like make the hand, hairs on your back of your neck stand up and that doesn't happen often. Um, but yeah, like you say, Watching the girls signing stuff in the crowd for the for the other young girls that's that's special. As they well. deserve that reward, right? They do, but actually the girls probably it, it's not about them. I think that they'll be so proud about what they're doing for that young girl if they're starting their journey into getting what they're having now. And you think about like so, Caitlin Beavers, um, you know, probably I coached Caitlin on like talent camps or like mm. Easter holiday camps and stuff like that. And now seeing what Caitlin's been able to access as a player, rightfully so. But then what the girl that Caitlin's signing in the crowd, what is her career going to be like in, in 10 years' time? And yeah. you think you just think of it from that point of view and it's it's exciting and, um, yeah, it, it's really good. And look, we started this conversation, didn't we, talking about role models? Yeah. And that's what's going to be so important is the fact that there will be five, six, seven-year-old girls in the crowd. I mean, I remember when I went to my first sporting event, it's something that stays with you forever. Mm -hmm. But that's where role models are built. Yeah. And the, the World Cup was so good for that, watching England and Brazil at Headingley. They packed it out with loads and loads of school kids and that, that was that was a real good moment in terms of looking at how far the games come. That was class. Mm. Yeah. Leeds, Leeds club is brilliant at engaging with the community, isn't it? I've, I've always, as a player, I've always seen how well they kind of, they get kids, they get schools, they kind of, they, they, they work really hard at the, the PDRL game, the wheelchair game, the women's game. I think it's, they're probably at the forefront of, um, of, of the, the, the sport in terms of engaging with the city where they live. Yeah, and and also we mentioned double headers, but a double header for the Challenge Cup final at Wembley. Yeah, is huge. It's insane. Like any player who plays the game, I think we've kept a few players in the game out of retirement because of that cherry mm. um, that they've, they've dangled. Um, but to yeah. be able to say you've played at Wembley, you know. Yeah, like obviously, even as a coach, to be like as a coach being at Ellen Road, that was that was special, and um, that was. You know, as a Leeds club, for us to play the Challenge Cup final at Ellen Road was that was that was that was incredible. To but to play at Wembley, like you say, is not many people can say they've done that. And for the women, they'll be the first. Mm. Um, so it, everyone wants to be there. I could hear you know at the launch yesterday, and people were saying that is the motivating factor for I think pretty much every team. Yeah. Do you want to look down the barrel of the camera and say Leeds are going to win the new season? <laughs> no, I'm all right. Is any trash talking? <laughs> Anyone you want to... No. No? I'll just quietly go about my business. <laughs> yeah, <I'll have> <laughs> quietly go and lift the trophy again. Yeah. Um, look, you, you are a busy bee at the moment, Lois, because you've also been named, as we mentioned, um, the New England women's <laughs> assistant coach. You okay, Mark? Yeah, I've got a cough. Is that yeah, all right? That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. I, I could be... A, to go to the doctors like John, but no. Yeah, Power well, we did actually vote. mention that. You've given away a secret, John has left the podcast, but he's also gone to the, the doctors, so get well soon, John. <laughs> you don't mean that. Yeah. Um, you're going to be involved for the first time in the France game. Yes. Yeah, in your England kit. Um, I'm not going to do a John Terry. I'll be wearing, like, yeah, I'm wearing like <laughs> no, England coaching, coaching, kit, yeah. coaching kit. Yeah. End of April. Um, 
Yeah, so How excited I, to get that, that job, Lois? Yeah, so I um I I was in and around sort of the environment um before the World Cup and um I I had my little lad so I fell pregnant, I had my little lad and after I took maternity leave I decided that I won't go back into into that environment. I took the, the Knights coaching role like a year year on. Um I felt at the time that I, when I wanted to be involved in an England environment and an England um, team, it would be when I could give it everything that that I ever wanted to um, in terms of passionate passion, commitment, um, and just where I were at a player as a person. Sorry, I felt that for the World Cup in 2021, it were a bit too raw in terms mm. of giving it my all and being there as a coach. I felt like I was still in the mindset of I would have been there as a player if I'd still played and. I didn't really, I didn't really find that it sat, it sat quite well with me. So I think after the World Cup and a new World Cup cycle, Stu taking the head coach's role, I, I have a lot of time and respect for Stu, and have worked quite closely with him the past couple of years. And and he asked me if I'd if I'd come on board, and I were I were honoured that he'd asked me. It took, you know, I, I knew straight away I wanted to do it, so I just needed to make sure that I could commit as much as as possibly needed to be. And um, yeah, so it's bit his hand off, and I, I can't wait to get involved and look forward to 2025 in France. And I never said congratulations, so I completely forgot since I last seen you. Yeah. You just mentioned you had a little I mean, boy. How, how are you two, fitting this all in? a couple of weeks. I know, that's yeah, really so. bad, isn't it? No, I, I remember What's seeing on Instagram called? and I haven't seen you uh, since. It's called Ollie. Yeah. Ollie, nice. shout out to Ollie. Yeah, shout Ollie, yeah, I haven't seen as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but um, the big question, how, how the hell do you fit all that in with a new baby know. as well? He's still, a, he's still a baby at two, isn't he, really? Yeah, yeah, toddler. Yeah, terrible twos. Um, I like to be busy, I think yeah. I'd say. So yeah, I always am busy. Um, but it should, it was just in terms of like prioritising and making making a good schedule that fits everyone. So we've got a really supportive partner who, who we juggle it with and together nicely. And yeah, we've we've always been quite busy people, so that, that's not changed. But yeah, it, it's good. I make sure I've got enough time with him. He's, he's coming to an under 19s game with me tonight. Is so it? yeah, it can be ball Amazing. boy or, or whatever. I think yeah, just yeah, it's good. Yeah, um, and then in terms of England, with your England hat on, how much progress was made from the England women's point of view at the World Cup? Um, I think in terms of the performance in the in the semi final, the the girls were brilliant for for so much of the game, and I think they will take a lot from that, seeing how much they can compete. Um, I think there's only small tweaks needed to make make that a different outcome, which is really really pleasing. Obviously heartbreaking for the girls, but really pleasing to see that next time it, it's only it's only small bits here and there, and it, it's a total different game. Um, but I think that the terms of the profile that was raised, I think that the people that tuned in, the viewing figures were absolutely class. So in terms of the game, the game took massive, massive leaps in terms of the performance. I think that the squad took massive leaps in seeing that, you know, they do compete for a large, large, large proportion of the time. We've just got to make sure that probably a little bit smarter and understand where we can win that game really easily is, is the flip side. But how far are they away from Australia and New Zealand? Look, I think that we're heading in the right direction, and I think that we've sometimes got to realise that the grass is, you know, always greener. There's been a lot of talk around NRL and stuff like that, and it is it is really good, and it's a massive, massive, um, you know, step up in so many areas. But I think that when we're we've got our games that are like York v, uh, you know, York v Leeds Grand Finals, they, they, you know, those games aren't too far off uh, the standard. So we just need to keep banging the drum and having more competitive opportunities for the girls. So whether that's the, you know, playing the top three or four teams more often mm. or playing New Zealand and Australia in, in you know international tests a lot more often we can't get to 2025 and have just played against France and you know France and the home nations in, in the run-up to that um, we had Courtney Winfield Hill Mark remember on last season he said she, Lois was a very tough taskmaster we talked she, about a sort she's of a liar no she did <laughs> she did yeah no, she did. Is one of, this is the that's when you say like, corker. She, like corker yeah that's yes. awesome, yeah, yeah. she was brilliant she'll be a big loss for you guys yeah she is so yeah. she's still been in. She's been so Courtney's one of my one of my mates, and um, yeah, she's so funny. But um, she thinks I'm a, yeah, because she's so laid back. It's untrue, by the way. Oh, so she I'm needs a, it. She needs a whipping. In no, that I sense. wouldn't have even bothered. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, let Courtney be. She's got like, a bit of a lip, hasn't she? As well, I can imagine. She, no, she's not that. She's quick. She's quick witted. Yeah, she's funny. Does she not be so, like, Just give it your back a bit. I'll give you a funny one. So I told Ollie on the way up. So he, he told me about this. Um, that she she'd thrown me in the bus and said they were a tough task master. Master, I'm going to translate that and say I care. <laughs> and Courtney but, doesn't. No, no, no. She does care. No, no, she does care. But it was funny. So we, we were going to a semi-final. I can't remember we were playing, but we were at semi-final, and um, everyone would we'd met. We had, um, I think, Brad Dwyer were doing our shirt press as well for the for the uh, semi-final. And I told him to be there for a certain time. The girls had said, "Be here at whatever time, shirt press at this time." So there were two times. 
and she said that she read a different th- this time, but she totally missed it. So I rang her, obviously, it was semi-final day, it's a big day. Mm. I rang her and um, she, she answered the phone, I'm not gonna try and do her Australian accent, but she went, hey, mate. And um, I went, she's she quite clearly ain't reading the room here because I'm ringing her to say, where the hell are you? Yeah. And uh, she was just buzzing along and she was like, I'm just on Kirkstow Road. I was like, well, everyone's in, everyone's in the, you know, the meeting room and captain's late. Like, I thought, I thought something had happened. Like, where are you? She was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And then we, we got there and I was walking up the stairs with her and she went, I know this is really, probably really stressed you out, as she said, but if, if anything you want to take from this is, this is my best prep. You know, <laughs> I, I'm going to be good today. This is how I like it, you know. <laughs> roll in, roll out. And I just looked at her and thought... <laughs> she spun it I, around. Yeah, to like, I've got her OK. I've got Daniel Anderson, who's arrives two hours early to everything she does, having an absolute meltdown in there. Brad Dwyer telling me he's got to get off because he's booked breakfast with his mates at whatever time. And <laughs> yeah. we're now 20 minutes behind schedule because of you. But as long as you're all right, Courtney, we're sound. Yeah, <laughs> let's pack on. But these are all new challenges that you're going to yeah. have. And I'm just interested in the dynamic then when you go from being a head coach at Leeds to an yeah. assistant, where you're like one of the trusted lieutenants in an England coaching yeah. show what's that like it's a nice change for me to be fair because um I was doing the head coach's role for the, for the England Knights women um and I loved that and it was real tough taking that job to step away from that a little bit but actually you know not that it takes well it does take a little bit less time to be an assistant I can you know I can I can speak to Stu and he will be the one who, who's thinking of everything and I can be really good at what he needs me to do um and I and you know yeah, it's good. So it's a different, de- definitely a different dynamic as head coach. You've got to think about everything and have all the conversations and be everywhere. And as an assistant coach, I can take what I need to do and, and be really good. And actually, it's nice to be not that there. I can mm. be just here. A few more things I really want to talk to you about, and we did touch on this earlier, um, but Leeds becoming the first British side to announce that they're going to be paying players yeah. professionally yeah. in the 2023 season. Yeah. Um, how big of a step forward is that? How big of a role have you had in that? Um, yeah, obviously, like my role at Leeds is the head coach, but overseeing the the whole women's program. So looking after the women's team on and off field, um, with a lot of support by amazing colleagues at the club um, and the academy system and things like that. So anything to do with women's rugby is kind of I oversee and and try to support. Um, it, it's a massive step, but it's also you know not one to get carried away with. This is not going to start paying the girls' mortgage and you know by you know buying a second house or whatever like it is a step in the right direction in terms of making it um uh, like a, a step it, that is all it is it's a step in the right direction and we know that it has to be better next year and we know it has to be better the year after that but starting this step means that that's going to be the content you know the continuous payments always going to be a thing how do we make it more year on year and, and what is that progress and what does that what does the process look like and um the girls are well aware that it's a small step so our girls are getting paid a win fee um, but it's it's you know we need to make sure that when we do it we can keep it and progress it rather than go there and have to come backwards. Um, so there's there's loads that we need to do, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be good for the girls. It's good recognition, um, but we're well aware that we've we've got to start the ball rolling. You know, encourage other people to do the same, and then all head in the right direction. Sometimes it takes a team or a club to kind of push the boundaries forward. Wigan Rugby were like in the nineties were the first team to go full full time professional. And that one team pushing the boundaries makes all the others catch up. So I hope this step by you guys means that all the other clubs by the end of the season or next year, the year after, start start paying winning bonuses, and then it kind of snowballs from there. Yeah, and you've got to, you've got to start somewhere, and that that's our message to the girls. Like we've got such a good group at, at Leeds. Like you know we are paying them, but that's not been their motivating factor this preseason, and that's not what all the talk's been about. Like really lucky that the girls that we have are there because they care, they want to be the best version of themselves. Like all the stuff that you you need people who are going to be winners to have, they've mm. got it, like that. that's pleasing. Um, but they know that we can sit in that room and say, look, if you were here in 2018 or you were here in 2020, or you know, whatever year you came, you know that we will make it better the following year. And Gary's great at that. Um, you know, like last night, the girls getting fitted for sports bras. He's providing, you know, we're providing the girls with sports bras so that you know, mitigating cost as well as getting these win bonuses. Yeah. So, you know, they, they've got gum shields. They've got they've got boots last year. They've got the best co- best you know range of compressions as well. Like gives them the, no excuses as well yeah, to, to like, be the well, best, right? We're just giving them we're giving them all the support we can do, and that's the environment we operate in. It's high challenge, high support, and I think if you get that right, then that you know that's all you want. That's all the players want. That's all the staff want, and it's. It means that everyone's on the same page, but 
yeah, it, it is good. And I think the girls are, know that it's a small step, but the content in the fact that they know that year on year we have pushed to support even more and provide even more. Does it put you in the box seat then in terms of recruitment? Because you mentioned Amy Hardcastle. You know, obviously that was... I yeah. assume she would have known that the payment was coming and so on and other things she didn't would follow. actually no. you know no, no surprise didn't. for her no, no yeah so but she from, you know, from Halifax at uh, anyway. Halifax yeah, yeah yeah so I'd be a bit more so she played at Bradford as well so yeah. Amy played at Bradford when I played at Bradford we won the treble together did she get the um, Judas chance as well did she no because um, she stayed at Bradford and I went to Leeds and it was a tackle on Amy that got me the Judas chance so it's Amy's fault really <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, no, but so it, it, will it help you being ahead of other teams in terms of what you can recruit for next season um, probably yes and no I would say so a big part of Amy moving was the fact that it's close to home mm. so she was travelling to St Helens um, and it was you know costing her so when you talk about mitigating mitigating cost actually she's coming to Leeds takes her 25 minutes rather than an hour and 45 minutes um, and actually when, when we sat down and spoke it were about you know Amy's got um, a partner and, and a daughter and it was actually time was the the, mm. like, the thing that was more um you know, cost more for her. So yeah, it's nice that she will get that recognition in, in having win bonus and things like that. But I think she wanted to, to play at a club where it was on a doorstep and, and she felt really well supported and could enjoy her rugby. And I think that through speaking to some of our girls, they, you know, that message had been conveyed that, you know, through medical standards, whether mm. that's, you know, S&C, doctor, um, physio, whatever, we, we, we try and provide the best for the girls. And, and that stuff actually has more of an impact than the win fee. Um, long term and then we'll we'll gradually look at them becoming paid athletes but slow but steady So Lois we touched on it earlier but um, Wigan owner Ian Lennigan has had something to say um, I don't know if you've seen seen these comments but the fact that he thinks Leeds are paying their players a year too early um, what what do you make of that um, obviously Gary will have his reasons for doing it at Leeds perhaps wanting to be the first and wanting to be the, the pioneers and how far away do you think is full professionalism in the women's game um, I don't think it's too early. I think in terms of if people know the context around what we're doing and why we're doing it, they'd sort of like see it as being a real positive for the women's game. Um, in terms of being full-time professional, I, I, I don't know. It's how long is a piece of string. I think that those are the bits that have got to fall into place before that in terms of like broadcasting and more making the game more commercially viable. But, but we're definitely at, heading there. We're definitely heading there. Look at the progress the last couple of years. But, you know, you've got to remember... Sport, there's there's so much that we that everyone's putting into the game, and that's great because it, it that's what the game needs and what it warrants. But you've got to make it be able to wash its face, as as so like you know I'd be told like that's that's what needs to happen. Mm. Um, and we are getting there. Um, more people care, more people tuning in, more people coming to games, more people playing the game. That's the big thing as well. We need loads of girls coming through, so that player pool with the years to come allows you to choose elite players to fill the competition. Um, but I think you know the girls that are within our squad deserve that next step, and we've had since twenty you know twenty seventeen when we sat down with Gary. There's always been a three year plan, right? We've done that three years. What does the next three years look like? And that's always been part of Gary's vision is to be able to to financially contribute to the players, and we did that last year in terms of expenses and media appearance uh, fees um, to make sure that we aren't you know. If the girls give, you know, if the girls give time to the game in terms of going to a season launch, can we contribute and make sure that, you know, that we're supporting them for that and not asking too much? That we've got girls who who travel further afield, can we give them to, some contribution to their expenses? So, it's certainly heading there. And for us as a club, it wasn't too early, and hopefully, us making that step will encourage us to do so, and I'm sure it will. How can it be too early to reward a team for success, for all of the sacrifice on the field, off the field? Mm. I think it's bullshit. I think he's probably Lenning is probably annoyed that he's got to pay his players earlier than he envisaged because a, a, any rugby player of either of either code or, or either gender who, who plays and puts in the amount of time and effort um, that that the likes of Lois and, and the Rhinos do, they deserve to be rewarded. So I, I, just, I think it's a bit of a and nonsense would, comment to be honest. And I would say that the money isn't isn't the factor; it's the intent. So, you know, like in terms of Gary wants to reward, it, the money is not massive, do you know mm. what I mean? But it's the intent. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it's, it's it's a means of rewarding and kind of g just showing some gratitude for the, the, the what they do. So, yeah, mm. should be should have been done a long time ago. It's not too soon at all. What do you make, Lois, of, of people that, and there may be people who listen to this podcast, men, slightly misogynistic, dinosaur view, prehistoric 
view on the women's game? Because you must still hear this and see this on social media of kind of, oh, get back in the kitchen, the women should be playing. Because that, 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 there's still a lot of progression to be done. Like, you don't need to convince those people. The game is, is going to take off in itself. But do, do you still, does that still come into your life, those views? Oh, yeah, like... People have their opinions. There's a saying there, isn't it? I'm not going to say it's quite crude. We can yeah. say it. We can say what we want. Everyone's got an arsehole. Yeah, there you yeah. go. That's like opinion. Yeah. Everyone, everyone, opinions everyone. are like arseholes. Everyone's, everyone's got, got one. one. Yeah, yeah, and that's what came to mind. So, yeah, yeah it's not fact. It's an opinion. And, um, yeah, if they can't see it when they come to watch, you know, if they watch York v Leeds in the grand final, the girls put the body on the line. They're passionate. Um, they care. They're inspiring a, a young generation of girls. We're not out there to be the same game as the men's. We're out there to play women's rugby league, and um, the girls do it really, really well to a high standard. And they do it whilst juggling a million other things. You know, we've got mums, surgeons, like the, you know, people who are in the army have moved their life so that they can they can play that sport. So, mm. you know, all I see is we've got people who are passionate and care and and are, are performing at their highest level because they're playing in the grand final and respect that because. It, it, it's warranted. It's best handy having a surgeon in the team. She's <laughs> left now. She retired, she? but no. um, she was good. I mean, was everyone going? Oh, elbows. No, it won't. She won't like a sports surgeon, no. but yeah, Lummers. She left last year. She was she was class. I mean, she brought yeah another dynamic to our team. But yeah, she was she was really good. She was. She I wonder was if she good. operated on John. Yeah. Maybe, maybe nineteen. Not. Nineteen. She's uh, she's, yeah. Yeah. You might have another one coming. <laughs> That's not a threat. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Was it was his a threat to me? I mean, could I have sit taken down. that? What was it? Sit, sit down, down or, or I'll shut you up. Or I'll sit down or I'll sit you down, was it? No, yeah. it was. Because no. that would have been a threat. Yeah. I mean, could yeah, I have taken was, that? It was threatening behaviour. Could, could I have taken that to the East Hull Constabulary? Constabulary, potentially, yeah. yeah. It was threatening behaviour. I, I felt uneasy. I felt You could do an injunction against the restraining order. Yeah, I guess I can sense him here, but he has left the podcast. He might be outside. Yeah. Um, just to finish up, um, obviously in the men's Super League, it's the rivals round, Mark. You've played for Wigan mm. and for Saints. What makes Wigan and Saints so special, that game? Um, I think over the last 20, 30 years, you'd look at Wigan Saints, Leeds, Bradford and the whole derby as the, yeah. as the three big ones. What sticks out to me for Wigan Saints is the fact that those two teams have always had lots to play for. They've always been competing for the top spot or finals or, or whatever. So I think the the level of, of, of athlete playing in the game spurs it on that a bit more than the others. I think there's obviously been the interesting episodes with Ben Flower, the, the good fa Friday fight that John started when he got filled in by um, Terry Newton and the Scully Farrell thing. I think actually the, the, the rivalries between positions has been interesting because in the early 2000s, you had Andy Farrell and Scully, two great players that, that, that had a battle in their own right. You had Radlinski and Wellens, who were the best in their field. You've had probably Tompkins and Lomax. You've had all these matchups of players from either town and either club that have just made it made it matches within the match. And I think it's 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 just been a bit bit of an elevated standard than the other the other the other derbies. Lois Wigan Saints, when you've watched that, what does that mean to you over the years? You always tune in for that Easter Friday. Yeah, yeah, I've I've always loved watching that. But when we were talking about the the, the derby games, I was I was thinking the, the Leeds Bradford ones, and I was actually lucky enough to to be doing the coverage. Um, with no, was John doing it that day? I don't think he was, but maybe with J Jamie Peacock and um, Robbie Hunter. If the money was right, he would have been there. Bradford, uh, Bradford turned Leeds over in the cup. So, and I think it always comes down to the fans. I think the fans get into it as well. It's yeah, like which group of fans are better. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and that, that always makes me laugh quite a bit. It's like that's yeah. a competition, like off the field, like yeah. which group of fans are better. But yeah, looking forward to the Wigan and Saints derby. Yeah, um, which is the biggest derby? Obviously, if John was here. We could have asked him about the Hull derby. Why that was so special from a boy from East Hull who came from nothing and playing for, for Hull before leaving them. And all the operations. Uh, and all the operations, but then we're just leaving them in, the, in his dust and then going to St. Helens when he was about 14. Yeah. But he did play, and he, you know, he never did. No, he didn't. He never did, didn't he? That's mm. his biggest regret. Yeah, Got a whole regret. derby, and I know you've not played in one, but have, we, is that bigger than Saints? Wigan? I don't know. I think Hull as a city is rugby league mad, so I think it captivates the city more than Wigan and Saints does. Um, the crowds are bigger, I'd say, if it's at the, at the at FC. But for me, just because of well, there's more on the line, in Wigan Saints Derby normally than, than the others. Sum it up in three words, Mark. You're so good with words. <laughs> I'm I'm good when it's few words, aren't I? Yeah. Um tribal. Um relentless. Uh 
and spine tingling. The atmosphere is always the hyphen. Hairs, yes, the hyphen. So it's yeah. the hairs on the back of your neck are always up when that. The game. You should check with Carol Vorderman that we can have spine tingling. What? Why? Because it. Yeah, no, no, we, we got it. You've got a hyphen. It's hyphen. You've hyphened it. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Why, why Carol Vorderman? She does the numbers, doesn't she? But she used to send the, the line. She's on the line. <laughs> on a, on a, she, used <laughs> she used to work to. on a. Rachel a word Riley show. put me in touch with her. Anyway, um, the there we go. Well. Lois, thank you so much yeah, for coming yeah. in. Um, <laughs> what are you laughing at? I just said they do letters as well. They do letters as well, yeah. But Carol was, and she was a numbers lady. Wasn't I know she was a numbers lady. I know, lady. I've met Carol. Have nice. you? Yeah, yeah. You did, didn't you? You went yeah. to ask it with her? Well, I didn't go with her. I bumped into <laughs> well, let's not get she, talking. Uh, she's a big rugby league fan. <laughs> that's true, actually. Maybe we can get her on the podcast. Hold on, because there's a position that's freed up on the podcast. Let's get Carol Vorderman in. Carol Vorderman, who mm. else is famous that you know? Noel Gallagher, remember when you gave him the vouchers for your coffee shop? I don't know. I've tried speaking to Noel Gallagher and he brushed me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who else? He's the most famous. Are you listening, Noel? Kelvin, you know Kelvin Fletcher, don't you, from Strictly? You could get him on. Yeah, and Coronation Street. Yeah, Coronation Street. Yeah. yeah. Don't we'll have a think. That. Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. Yeah, Russell Crow. Russell Crow, Carl yeah. Amore. There's loads of contenders. Uh, Phil Clark. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, look, if you are just tuning in, I don't know why, because it's the end, but uh, John Wilkin has left the podcast. And we well, you won't be back. But, vote for um, us. Yeah, vote for us. Um, um, review for five stars podcast of the year in the rugby section. But just like to say to John, thanks so much for all your work over the years. Yeah, all his endeavours over the years have been great. Yeah, um, been there's, a, there's a lot know, to Got say. us more clicks, more likes. It's been a great platform for you know just launching his career because he's off doing lots of other things. Yeah, at the minute, isn't we're it? proud of him. It Maybe it's time to, to leave the nest, to flock, to to hire. We climates. keep in touch with John. May I Maybe see him no, around in the coffee shop yeah, or something, but you haven't um, really of, of late. Anyway, no, it's that's fine. Went to his wedding, but yeah, um, colleagues. Yeah, definitely not friends anymore. Um, but John, thank you so much, <laughs> and thanks, um, John. Uh, all the best for the future. Yeah, thanks, Lois. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there. Sunday, 9th of April. Yeah, get yeah. the double header on. Leeds v York. Get the double header on. The I'll never wear gloves. The In fact, oh, can, can you wear gloves for us? I just want you to wear as a coach short sleeves no. and gloves and just. Can you imagine the girls <laughs> see me sat in the stand with gloves on. I'm not getting a stick for that. No. Oh, uh, Lois, thank you so much, Mark. You've been fantastic. You've really filled John's shoes. Who needs John Wilkins? Been six or seven out of ten as usual. Yeah, and in terms of numbers out of ten, give us a five out of uh, five, if you, if you would. Only five <laughs> it's out of five. Not ten, it's do. five, but five. Yeah, we're up at four point eight. We're slowly climbing up to that four point nine. Yeah. Um, wherever you get your podcast, wherever you download them from, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all those different places. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week without John. Who knows who's going to be the co-host next week? We'll find out. Bye. Bye.